Let's take a moment and revisit my all-time favorite concept from both thermodynamics and food science, water activity. Water activity turns out to be very important in a food like this. Um, why? Well, part of the point, why does this exist if the world also contains bread, right? This has most of the same ingredients as bread. We use it in similar function. Uh, it serves a similar niche in terms of uh, what people eat. Um, well, this lasts much longer than bread, right? Uh, it does so because its water activity is very low. So if we were to work this out, this would have a water activity um, like a typical bread uh, will have a water activity in the vicinity of 0 0.86, 0 0.87. Um, its crust will have a lower water activity because that is uh, more dehydrated because it was on the outside as steam was leaving the loaf. However, as time goes by, water will migrate. Remember, water goes from where activity is high to where activity is low. So in a loaf of bread, you will have migration of water from the interior uh, to the exterior, to the crust. And that's why if you say buy a loaf of crusty bread and let it sit around in a sealed container for a few days, you end up with it having kind of the same texture all the way through and not that nice snap on the outside. So something similar going on here. These last much longer than bread in the first place because they tend to have a water activity around say 0.6. So that's great. That means they snap. Oh dear. Uh, I just got cracker crumbs all over my computer keyboard. Not the wisest choice I've ever made. Anyway, in the name of science, right? Um, it's got a lovely crisp texture, which is fun. And that low, low water activity means that mold's not gonna grow on this. It's not gonna sustain any microbial life. So it keeps for a very long time. The ways in which this sort of foods uh, goes bad aren't microbial storage. It goes bad uh, for other reasons like staling, which we'll talk about separately, uh, or it gets kind of like mushy, which people often will use the word stale for, but it, it has, it's a different chemical mechanism from other forms of stale. So that is maybe if I say left this cracker sitting outside and the squirrels didn't get it, um, it's summer now, right? So the relative humidity outside is rather high. It's say 0.85 relative humidity, 85% relative humidity. That means that uh, that's how close the air is to being saturated with water. Turns out water activity for uh, a vapor is equal to the relative humidity of that vapor. Whereas water activity uh, in, a, in a solid or in a liquid is closer to its, its mole fraction. Um, and so what, what does that mean? That means here's a food with a water activity of 0.65 sitting in an environment with a water activity of 0.85. And I just said, hey, water goes from high activity to low. So what is it that happens to this? and to your potato chips, and to your popcorn, and to any of these other sort of snack foods you think about it that are dry and crisp and, and snap. If you let them sit in a humid environment, they absorb, they literally absorb the water right out of the air. And in so doing, they lose that lovely crisp texture. So that is uh, a couple of things that are happening with water activity and this food. So. What's in a cracker and what does this have to do with its water activity? Well, first off, we need a source of starch, which usually is wheat flour, but it honestly could be other forms of flour as long as you're capable of making this stick together. That sticking, that is making this cracker be a cohesive thing, usually comes from the gluten within the flour. So this is a uh, protein that when you work flour, uh, coils and aligns and makes the dough tough and strong in the way that you could, for example, make bread. You need the dough tough and strong in order for it to capture the air bubbles that are made by your leavening. Those are air bubbles being captured by leavening. 
Uh, if you think of what happens in uh, bubbles that are in weaker forms of batter, you, uh, you know, or even just bubbles that you make in milk, they go to the surface, they pop, they go away. So we want something that can trap that as it goes. So uh, that, the flour, is what gives us our starch and our structure. Following that, we have a form of fat. What does the fat do? Well, fat tastes good. That's a big part of it. Fat also tenderizes. What does that mean? Well, up above, I just said we needed gluten to hold things together. And you can make gluten-free uh, crackers. Um, you'll notice they behave a little bit differently if you compare, say, a rice cracker, which is zero gluten or very low gluten, to a flour cracker, which is higher. Um, you just need some form of polymer. Uh, I have spelling that can form the matrix that's going to track, uh, trap things. So we can use other things for that. Um, fat, when I say tenderizes, it can't participate in the starchy or glutinous polymer network. It messes that up. It, so uh, remember, fat uh, will, in general, want to be in a different phase than something that is watery. And when we're making this dough, it is watery. And so the fat will sit there in tiny little blobs and just basically get in the way. A limiting case of this is if you imagine a croissant uh, or pie crust where we have layered the fat between the places where we have allowed the polymer network to kind of entangle and form between the flour, and you actually get completely distinct layers because they're separated by fat. Um, in a non-puff pastry, in a non-layered uh, pastry, this just is happening at a micro scale where these little blobs of fat are sitting there getting in the way. Okay, we also need water. And you may or may not see water on an ingredient list. Well, you'll see it on an ingredient list for a recipe, but you might not see it on an ingredient list if you look at a commercial cracker, because so much of the water gets cooked out, uh, they may not, in fact, need to list it. But the water needs to be there. Why? Though, uh, otherwise, the starch is indigestible. Uh, see my other video for that. So uh, we need this starch gelatinization or starch gelation. We need to make the starch into nice, happy, uh, hydrated blobs of starch and water. Otherwise, it's going to be indigestible. It's going to taste raw. It's going to be nasty. Um, usually, we add some stuff for flavor. Might be salt, might be sugar, might be garlic, might be all manner of things, cheese. And uh, we also need a few more things. So we need leavening. What's leavening? Leavening is whatever it is that we've added that makes these lovely little bubbles inside the cracker uh, or the bread or the cake. And why do we need those bubbles? Uh, those bubbles aerate the food. So, and mixing air into food actually makes the food taste better. Um, it makes it more biteable and chewable uh, because it's, it'll, it keeps it from being tough. So uh, tenderness. So the basic trick in leavening is we need a way to get little bubbles of vapor trapped inside our otherwise solid matrix. And we need to do this in such a way that those bubbles stay there during the date baking process until our liquidy um, gel of a dough becomes something more solid. So what's happening with the leavening? Well, a couple of things are very important with the leavening. What we need is when we stick this uh, food into the oven, we need the little bubbles that are in the food, and we need to start with the nuclei of bubbles. That means we need to have some bubbles present to begin with, 
and our leavening, whatever it is we're doing, is only making those bubbles bigger rather than creating them from scratch. And we'll talk more about that in the next project. But just trust me for the moment, we need little bubbles to begin with. So we got those there by kneading, we got those there by mixing, we got those there uh, by however it was we combined things in the first place. Now, we need to make those bubbles bigger. So we need to enlarge those bubbles. Now, we can do this through production of steam. So when we have water in the mix, and if the water, if it's uh, got enough water that the water isn't completely held onto by hydrogen bonding with the starch, some of that water will turn into steam as it is heated. If we do this at a low temperature, the steam will be generated uh, very slowly and will tend to uh, not necessarily rapidly swell the bubbles and especially not swell them at the right time while the dough is still uh, uh, liquid and plastic and movable, but will in fact come later when it doesn't matter, it just leaves the system. So steam tends to work uh, with a wet dough and a hot, high temperature, you know, we're talking 450 Fahrenheit or more oven, because we need that temperature shock to get this, uh, enough steam at the right time. Or we can use a way of generating the gas through a chemical reaction. Baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate, when it reacts, it's a base, when it reacts with an acid, you get CO2 vapor. Also, if you raise its temperature quite a lot, um, up above, uh, I think it's uh, above 200 Fahrenheit, um, it will just burp out the CO2 on its own. Baking powder is uh, formulated so you don't need to also add an acid. It's got a solid acid in the mix with it. So, uh, so you will still generate CO2 gas, but as a result of these uh, two elements that you've dissolved that were parts of the baking powder, uh, becoming gaseous. Um, or you can have yeast, and yeast in its metabolic processes sits there and burps out CO2. There is an um, old formulation of crackers that would use ammonium chloride, uh, which would then generate ammonia gas uh, as, as uh, what would make the bubbles. Since ammonia gas is kind of toxic, we don't tend to use that anymore. So we can make CO2. And uh, the baking soda, by being a base, also contributes to the browning because it changes the chemical environment uh, for the starches. So that can be quite nice. It helps the Maillard reaction. So all of these things uh, might make CO2. They work to a greater or lesser extent. Baking soda kind of rapidly, as soon as it touches the uh, acid, it reacts. Baking powder is formulated, so the reaction only occurs as the temperature goes up. And then yeast, you it's a living thing. You have to have created the conditions uh, where it can thrive, and you have to have waited for it to get going for it to really work. So these are our forms of uh, aeration, and they also have flavor uh, implications, right? Like steam. It's water. We had water in the system already. It has a way it tastes. Um, baking soda and baking powder may have a, a bitterness and sliminess to them if they don't uh, uh, react completely. And yeast, in addition to making CO2, makes ethanol and a bunch of other flavorful compounds that really make yeasted breads stand out. Finally, in commercial breads, but not so much the homemade ones, we would find an emulsifier. And why would we find this emulsifier? Remember, emulsifier is a special class of chemicals that has both a uh, water-loving, hydrophilic, and a hydrophobic end, an oil-loving end. So what these molecules do is they arrange themselves around fats and uh, uh, elements of water in our food and make it more stable for them to stay in an environment where they would otherwise try and migrate out to the surface. So uh, an emulsifier, for example, is what makes it so salad dressing 
doesn't separate into just oil and water. What's it doing in the bread? Well, back to the idea of water activity and staling. And I just said bread, but this is also true for a cracker. If we zoom in, and I'm going to draw it for bread right now, but again, true for crackers. Remember the outside edge of the bread, because it is um, the uh, area where the most exchange happens with the environment during the baking process, has an exceptionally low water activity, right? And you can tell this because when you look at a cracker or a piece of bread, that outside has gotten brown, which remember meant it went up over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, where uh, liquid water really uh, isn't present in a system to an appreciable extent anymore, at least not at uh, atmospheric pressure. But that is not the case in the middle. And if we think about a bread, we want the inside to be tender. If we think about a cracker, we need, while we want most of the water out of the system so that we could uh, uh, make this cracker crisp, we need a little bit of water or the starch does what is called retrogrades. It stops being a gel anymore and goes back to being a crystal. And that is uh, a big component of being stale. That is, so that is the starch, which remember we made a nice gel out of by hydrating it with heat and water. Eventually, if that water can leave the uh, system, we're left with starch hydrogen bonding with itself again. And it, uh, it kind of goes crystally. And you will have had the experience, perhaps, of eating a piece of bread that's done this. Or uh, we see it a lot if you have rice that you want to reheat, and it's just gone to crunchy, and its physical appearance looks totally different. There, you've had the, the starch retrograde. It has become uh, crystalline again. It's lost too much of its water. So we have two very important water activity related things going on here. So in our model system here, we have higher water activity in the center. We have lower water activity on the outside. So water wants to go from the center to the outside. And uh, if we wait long enough, uh, depending on the relative humidity of the surroundings, which I am just drawing as this amorphous cloud here, water may go in either direction. It may go out uh, from our system to the surroundings, if the surroundings are particularly low humidity over time, and that may lead us to the starch retrogradation. Um, or, of course, remember, if the surroundings are high relative humidity, uh, it may, uh, the water may come in. And so these are two components that people refer to both of them as stale, even though they're kind of operating in opposite directions and uh, have opposite things you could do about them. So um, the starch retrogradization comes from the water migrating out of uh, starch granules where we need it to be. And the uh, other form of stale, the kind of mush, the loss of crisp, comes from water generally coming from the environment and uh, increasing the water activity of the cracker or the bread. All right, coming back to the emulsifier. Well, what's an emulsifier doing? An emulsifier can't change thermodynamics. Uh, thermodynamics says stuff goes from high water activity to low water activity. Can't do a blessed thing about that. But um, we can change how fast that happens. And so if we put a whole bunch of emulsifiers into our food, what we can end up doing is having sort of a protective uh, layer of uh, around uh, segments that are higher in water. And so we have created a barrier of sort of oily bits from the outside of the emulsifier that can help stir of simplification. There's a whole lot of thermo here I'm not getting into. Um, they basically can help hold that water in. And even though the driving force is still such that uh, we want we want. The natural world is forcing water to move from high activity to low activity. What uh, actually happens here is it happens very, very slowly because this oil layer from the emulsifier uh, 
uh, that has been created around the outside makes it difficult for that water to move. So yay! Um, and this makes it, so the use of emulsifiers is a key difference between what you would see in a commercial product and a home product. And it's part of what allows uh, them to last much longer than if you do something at home. So if you, uh, for example, imagine a loaf of uh, French bread that you buy, for, or Italian bread, you know, bread that's got a really crispy crust that you buy from a bakery, um, it won't have that kind of additive to it. And you've got to eat that same day or the next day, um, or it is day old bread, right? Like the crispiness of the crust is just gone and you may start getting staleness on the interior. Uh, whereas uh, a loaf of commercial bread, if you buy at the store, it's fine all week. And that is from our friends, the emulsifiers. The biggest emulsifier in this application, uh, lecithin. And uh, that is a way that water activity is controlled. And those of you who uh, have always wondered part of how Twinkies can last so long, that comes back to control of water activity and managing how this uh, migration can happen.